Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Introduction to Theater. My name is Wynn. Let's just get right into this. Um, today, we're talking about the director and the producer, which is in chapter five of your book. So please follow along. And uh, just, just so you know, all of this in your book is fair game for the test that is coming up very soon. So uh, if you have any questions, if you have any comments about the book and things that you have found or anything that you wish to correct me on, please just go ahead and uh, post that in the discussions or just email me privately if you just want to have a private conversation. But let's just get into this. The director uh, in the theater and in film and in television essentially is the same kind of responsibilities. They are the captain of the ship. They're the ones that decide on what are the themes of the play? What are the things that we want the audience to focus on? What do we want the uh, the the nugget the core of this this play to say and how we want it to affect other people we're going to talk a little bit about the organization of the director some some terms and some keywords that you need to know for the upcoming test and just for general uh theater knowledge yeah so the first thing i wanted to just point out is if you were a director if if someone gave you like a couple a cool million dollars and just said uh hey make me a movie what would it be? Uh, what kind of writers or what kind of stories would you be attracted to? What are, what are, the, what are the types of um, things that you want to, to introduce the world to? Um, so let's just take a couple of these examples that are out here, right? We got Quentin Tarantino over here. We got Tim Burton. We got Sofia Coppola and we got Spike Lee. So uh, I just wanted to point out the different flavors that these different directors have, the different images, these stark contrasting um, images and views that, that come with their material. You'll see that like Tim Burton has, it, he's like in a dreamscape of these, these non-realistic figures and kind of like horrific, um, yeah, makeup and, and, and monsters and, and really vibrant colors sometimes contrasted with really dark uh, grays and, and, and blacks and white and stuff like that. He's a really uh, image-based director and he's all about that texture and images in, in, his, in his film uh, versus Quentin Tarantino, which is really stylized. He's all about this, this type of um, narrow, not narrow, kind of like just kind of like realistic, but hyper, hyper maybe heightened realism we're going to talk about these terms all in here in a second but these kind of characters that are that are a little special that live in normal circumstances and he really just has like a style that's definitely just quentin tarantino's and sofia coppola is all about that soft texture and um has has these like really comic book like uh imagery and and flavor to them like Marie Antoinette lost translations, the bling ring and stuff like that, a really image based, softer texture, but still kind of like stylized and, and flamboyant in a way. And then we got Spike Lee, who is, who is much more political than the other two. Um, definitely has something to say about the place where he grew up in New York city and the type of people that you find there um, in black lives are really, really things that are important to his his viewpoint and his his storytelling he it does help when you when you're a writer and a director all at the same time you can control a lot of that narrative so all of these are excellent directors and i just want to ask you the question what kind of stories would you guys direct uh go ahead and let me know in the in the comments section or in in the in the in the discussion forum whenever you guys get a chance yeah i'd love to hear that so I have a couple of clips here that I want you to watch. Go ahead and pause this video and, and come back and we can, we can discuss them in greater detail. I got two of them that I want you to watch right back to back. I want you to watch The Last Jedi first and then I want you to watch Hero. And then come on back and, and we'll, we'll talk about it, okay? Pause the video and come back. So welcome back. Um, we're just here to compare and contrast these two fight scenes from two very different uh, very different directors, very different types of movies, and what wants to be highlighted? What, what, what are some similarities? What are some, um, some differences that, that come into your mind when we're thinking about these two films? And what are some things that are important that the director wants to say, look, pay attention to this. This is my style. This is who I am. 
as a person, as a director, as an artist. This is the thing that I want. I want the audience to see. I want, I want your eyes to go there. And Hero, it's much more of a dance. It's much more artistic and, and beautiful almost. It's just these two characters who are supreme combatants, who are uh, excellent um, swordsmen, uh, are going, going through this ritualistic dance and end up finding the conflict in themselves in, in much more deliberate um, close shots into their faces um, versus really heavy choreography, which you see in The Last Jedi. Um, much more violent, much faster, uh, an emphasis on the battle itself and how painful it can be and how much rage and anger these both of these characters have and they're letting that out and that is that's a focal point of this of this show i love star wars and all of its entities and i think this is an excellent example of showing like you know anger is a part of the dark side and and that's that's a big conflict especially for the character ray who who is constantly being pulled to different directions and she knows giving into anger is not a great thing to do we know that from watching the rest of the movies and it's funny to see her it's fun to see her unravel um, in anger so that's being highlighted by the director here's another clip why don't you go ahead and pause this we'll talk about it when you get back this is from crazy rich asians go ahead pause the video welcome back uh so what do we want from a director what are the things that we want a director to be responsible for so if we're talking about film and television, directors are really responsible for a lot of things. They're responsible for keeping things under budget and making sure that, that a film shoot is, is happening with the, um, with, with the appropriate uh, pieces moving all together. Sometimes it takes a crew of thousands of people to bring together a film and especially a film like this in crazy rich Asians where they're using uh a combination of, of digital technology and, and on-site locations. Directors have to manage who's going where and what is being accomplished at what time. And it can all get really confusing. And so if you get a director who is not um, experienced in this kind of venue or not experienced in this kind of format, then that's where you see some problems arise with some of these movies that are rushed and didn't have a chance to, to breathe because the director wasn't sure of what they were doing. Some of these smaller budget action films or smaller budget um, comedies and stuff like that really don't suffer from that problem because we can, we can take some time and there's a lot of money to be had, but if it's a new time director and just trying someone trying to learn on their feet, then it can, it can suffer. This film is excellent because uh, there's a lot of love and care that goes into the things that, that this director wanted to highlight in um, in this movie and puts it off in a very comedic way. Um, I really love how they used a combination of location and a digital back back lot that that caused us to think like, oh, this is a really um, huge environment and this is this is really spectacular. And so I I really like how the director was able to put together all of those elements to 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 tell the story of this really rich family and this character who is seeing it for the first time, seeing the actual like, whoa, this is, this is a different kind of money that I'm used to. Um, just a point of reference, just some, or something that I should, should mention at this point. In your book, it highlights that the director in an American usage is the person that is responsible for all the aspects of, of the play. If it is the British equivalent um, we're talking about if you go to England or the, the islands of Great Britain um, in Ireland or Scotland or places like that, um, this person is called the producer, okay? Which is very different than the producer in, in here in the States. We think of a producer as being a person responsible for the money and a person responsible for finding the funds to, to produce our project. And then the director is the artistic helmsman the person that that guides the ship. The, the producer is the one that really deals with the money in American usage. But if you go to England and you see, and you, you hear someone say, uh, talk to the producer, that means the director. They're talking about the director. Just to, something I wanted to clarify, uh, clarify here, and that will be on the test, so remember that. 
Um, so there's a style to these pieces. There's a style to, to what we're talking about here with theater. Um, when you go to pick a play, you get to decide on how realistic this, this piece is. So there are three types of styles that I want you guys to remember in this class. And the first one is called naturalism. And it kind of goes in, it's, it's almost like a spectrum, right? It's like, it's almost like this line. It's a long line of how fantastical or how, how crazy are we going to get this play? We start at naturalism, which is a slice of life. Um, this is the world that I live in right now. This is a naturalistic world, um, existing with technology and with, um, uh, clothing that seems natural to the time period and all that stuff. Um, so if you are producing a naturalistic play on your stage in a proscenium stage, you better believe, um, if your play says that there is working water on stage, you have better have a sink that turns on and water comes out of that faucet because we're going for a slice of life. We want it to be as close to real life as possible. We're talking about naturalism. And that's A Streetcar Named Desire. That's um, Death of a Salesman. That's Fences that you, I showed you guys that clip from our la acting lecture. Um, these are the naturalistic pieces that are written for theater that are supposed to be, they're supposed to look like regular life. Um, and then we get, we get a little farther on our, our realm of fantastical, um, this becomes heightened realism, which is, it just means that the lines are more realistic, but the set and costume designs can be abstract or symbolic in some way. So if you think about something like, I don't know, Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters is heightened realism because you have people who, who exist in New York City at a time in the 80s, um, and the only fantastical aspect of that the only parts of that that are kind of out there is the fact that they catch ghosts for a living right so that can be a little bit of heightened realism the lines can seem realistic but in reality um there's there's this element of ghost um and those proton packs and stuff like that that they use that just doesn't seem like it's real life so it's not quite it's not quite like Lord of the Rings and just fantasy. There's still some aspects of reality in there, but it's not real, right? And then we have non-realism. I'm going to talk about two, two different types of that. Um, but this is high fantasy, poetic drama or musical theater, absurdist theater and symbolism. Here's just a point uh, that I wanted to make. Musical theater is always non-realism because... People don't break into song in everyday life, right? Uh, I mean, you may break into song in everyday life, but you may not have like a full orchestra that kind of just conducts this fully realized piece of music in your, in your life. That just doesn't happen. We do see things like that in, in musical theater or in comedies like Anchorman or something like that when they they sing Afternoon Delight or or there's a million other references that I can make where a non-realistic element pops into into our normal story because of that musical theater um, venue. So absurdist theater and symbolism are some other types but these are the two types of realism that I want you guys to remember. These are going to be on the test so remember this an allegory. An allegory is a symbolic representation of abstract themes through characters, action, and other concrete example, um, concrete elements of production like scenery. So, um, yeah, this is this is this is essentially like all of your fairy tales. Every fairy tale is an allegory for something deeper that that is that is meant to be some kind of moral lesson. It's supposed to be kind of like a moral lesson in your life. Um, so, like, if we take Little Red Riding Hood, who's going off to to visit her grandma in the woods, and she takes her um, basket out to see her, the the kind of allegory there, and she meets a wolf along the way, and then the wolf tricks her. Um, the whole point of that story is to be wary of strangers, be, be wary of people that you don't know because you can't trust um, anyone really. Like you, you never know who the wolf is going to be. That's an allegory, right? And so that's all of the, the fairy tales that you've heard. That's all the Disney stuff. That's a very allegorical um, 
non-realistic way of telling a story. And then we have expressionism, which is um, showing the outward expression of inner feelings. Um, the attempts in drama to depict the subjective state of a character or a group of characters through um, shush non-realistic techniques as distortion, striking images, and poetic language. Okay, so um, expressionist art, uh, any of you artists out there, I'd love for you to, to comment in the discussion forums and show me some, a piece of expressionist art so that the rest of the class can kind of see the idea of like, what is expressionism? What, is, what are we talking about here? It's essentially anything that you can interpret as your inner feelings. Whatever you're, you know, you're truly feeling on the inside, let's let those be, be shown outwardly. Right. So if, if we're talking about rage or rage and we might paint the whole set red, red, so that we, that we associate those two color, like the color red with, with anger and rage and stuff like that. That's a very expressionist thing. So here I, I got a couple of styles. Um, I won't go through like why they're all these different styles, but I just wanted to, to hear from you guys. Uh, please let me know in the discussion forums. Let me know um, what you think about each of these styles. I got one right here. This next one. So the, the first one was one. This is two. This is one. This is two. This is three. Tell me the styles. Tell me, tell me what you think. Which, which one's which out of those three um, that we talked about before. Naturalism, heightened realism or non-realism, okay? So now we have a term here that's coined in your book called the directorial concept, um, also known as the director's vision. I hear that a lot in the, in the theater world, being in it myself. Um, but directorial concept essentially means um, what is your vision? What is your idea? So this is from Rose Rage um, in the Chicago Shakespeare Festival. Um, and you, as you can see, the themes and the style of this play is very non-realistic. It's very fantastical and flamboyant. Um, and a lot of colors, a lot of really interesting themes going on here of, of, um, of murder, of intrigue, of, of um, hierarchy and, and um, the regal, royal characters. Uh, mixing with non-realistic characters that uh, you can see like all these people just in in very in various um, beautiful outfits being around like slabs of meat and prisons and stuff like that and it's like it's it's juxtaposition of the grossness of of these circumstances and the heightened clothing of 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 whatever time period they're going after so that's just the term that I want you guys to remember, a directorial concept. You will have to discover this in your final project when we go over um, what you think your vision for A Midsummer Night's Dream is. That will be your directorial concept and you get to direct it however you want. However you want this, this piece to go is up to you. An auteur director in French means author director. An auteur means author um, in French. The auteur director is also the playwright in many senses. It, it's, it's a person who writes and directs, um, who can adapt the play into something different, into something that they they wish to be their own. So this is from Metamorphosis, which is an old story, it's an old Greek story that Mary Zimmerman uh, ad adapted to more, um, to more, more normal circumstances, for lack of a better word. Um, I guess it's still very fantastical, but she introduced this aspect of water for, for modern audiences. That was the term I was looking for, more modern sense, so that we can understand the language, that Greek language, a little bit easier, right? <clears throat> so she put some water elements into it. That's the main thing that she did, and she changed the language to be a little bit more accessible to, to our generation. That's something that an auteur director can do. It can change the language. They can change some themes, but mainly they, they are the ones that, that dictate what they, what they want seriously. And there are kind of, there's some challenges that come to being an auteur director. It, it's a lot of work. 
it, it ends up being a ton of work for you if you, especially if you're not used to directing for the first, if it's your first time or, or something like that. If you're a young director, that can be very difficult to write and direct something. But on the other hand, um, it can really be helpful to control everything. If you're just a real, if you're a person that just likes to be in control of all of the aspects of, of the theater, all the aspects of your project, then maybe this is the right thing for you to just be the one that's controlling everything so that when it flops or when it succeeds, you will either get all the praise or all of the vitriol that comes with that title. So, um, what is the role of the director? What are some things that a director is responsible for? So these are some terms in your book that I wanted you guys to know. This will be on your test. Um, casting. I'm sure you guys know all about casting. Um, <clears throat> casting or, or a type casting is a very big topic, especially now because of the Black Lives Matter movement that's happening in, in the nation right now. Um, it is really interesting to see how many theater directors and theater producers around the, the country are changing their ideals of are their ideas of what it means to cast a show or what kind of shows we're producing so that we can be inclusive to everybody else. Um, Typecasting essentially means that we're going to we're going to cast someone who we feel is right for the part, and it's really messed up, um, but in the past it would kind of it would seem like the types of people that would be cast as disney princesses were just very beautiful white girls and those types are changing hopefully uh for good for for this day and age and for what we're we're seeing now in the type of world that we're creating the type of theater that that we want everyone to see that we want our children to grow up in this type is fluctuating, but it is still exists, still definitely exists, especially in Hollywood. If anybody, if any of you have gone out there to an audition in, in Hollywood or, or LA trying to get an acting job, you'll see that they care much more about your appearance than they do about your acting talent really at all. Or everyone likes to just kind of put you in this little box to say that like, oh, you're black? Well, you'll be perfect for these characters. You'll be perfect for this character. Oh, you're Latino, then you'll be perfect for this. Oh, you're, you're a white guy, then you, you'll be, you can fit all of these, these boxes, right? So we just wanna be aware of typecasting and how that, that can change. There is a term in your book that is coined um, a postmodern director. I want you guys to remember what a postmodern director is. A postmodern director can use deconstruction um, to facilitate different elements in theater. They can use this, this term called deconstruction to colorblind cast or to cross-gender cast a show. Um, or they can use something like uh, music and technology to assist uh, the storytelling techniques. That's called a postmodern director. So a postmodern director move would be like casting... Um, I don't know, a postmodern directing. If you guys have seen the 1990s um, Cinderella movie with Brandy and Whitney Houston in that, um, that's definitely a postmodern move right there to make the, the entire cast of, of blacks, of black people um, per, acting as characters like Cinderella and the fairy godmother. That's, that's a postmodern move and those are things that are happening a lot today. Um, also postmodern move would be casting Romeo and Juliet as two women, two women characters and it being like, a, um, yeah, like, uh, raising, raising LGBTQ, uh, issues here and there. That's a postmodern move. So I want you guys to remember that term, the postmodern director. Okay. Directors are responsible for rehearsals. Um, the term that is coined for directing actor movement is called blocking. So if a director says, actor A, I want you to move to stage left, actor B, I want you to go to stage right, and then you guys cross together, and then you'll meet up at the middle, that's called blocking. Actor movement, planned actor movement is called blocking, okay? The audience's eye is very important for the director to, to get under. Um, it's, it's essentially what, what the audience is supposed to see. Are they supposed to see this little conversation happening downstage left or are we supposed to shift our frame 
to look at the big thing that's flying in through the rafters. Um, what is the audience supposed to look at? And the director is supposed to facilitate that and make sure that the audience is all looking at the same thing. It's, it's almost like they're, they're holding up a camera and you use that with lighting techniques, with sound techniques, with movement, with pace, rhythm, and um, yeah, and that's exactly what I was going to talk about next. I got a little bit ahead of myself, but yeah, movement, pace, and rhythm is really essential to to an actor or to a director's um, motivations. You got to make sure that play moves. You got to got to make sure that it has a little bit of pep and step, or else the audience is going to fall asleep, or they're going to walk out. A tech rehearsal is something that a director is halfway responsible for. At the end of the rehearsal prog process, the director kind of hands the reins off of this off to the stage manager, and then the stage manager kind of becomes the captain of the show after a while. So tech rehearsals is a time when we put together some tech, um, like lighting and sound, and we might throw in a fog machine here or there. We might try to use some of that time to to fix our fly system or to organize uh, different different tech pieces in the set to move together or to use those rehearsals as um, a time to go over our blocking, whatever it needs, whatever we need to do in tech, that's, that's a time to take care of that. But it's, it's probably essentially used for lighting and sound designers to get their stuff together. And then we go into dress rehearsals, which are the usual, usually about like a week. I don't know if you're in Broadway, it's probably a couple weeks long of dress dress rehearsals, um, which is full blown in your costumes. The set should be up and painted. The lights should be ready to go and the sound is ready to start so that we can start running through the show like it should be in real life. And then if you're lucky enough to be in a show on Broadway or off Broadway, you have something called previews. And previews, um, if, if you guys are interested in seeing theater in New York City or Chicago or, or downtown LA, and, and you find a chance to go see a preview, um, those tickets are usually pretty cheap and you can see a great show. The, the caveat is that these shows probably are not very polished. They're not finished yet. They're still in rehearsals, but it's very close. It's essentially a chance to gauge what the audience needs or what what the audience wants to see so that they could still change some things before opening night. And then once opening night happens, the director says bye-bye and they go on their merry way and the actors and the stage manager carry on from the, from there and they are in control of the show. Pretty cool, huh? So a lot to go in, a lot, lot to think about. This here is Julie Taymor, one of the greatest stage directors living today. Um, she directed The Lion King, which is still one of the, the most amazing technical feats on the stage today. And it's still touring around. I mean, not now because of COVID-19, but it has been for such a long time, such a long period of time. So that's it. That's, that's the lecture. I know it was a short one today and I know might have taken a little bit time here and there, but I appreciate your patience. Um, you do have a directing assignment. Make sure that you do the play background assignment before that, which is essentially uh, you watch your favorite film and then you comment on the in the discussions and talk about it um, a little bit and, and discuss your favorite film. I think that's just a fun little assignment I added here and there. Um, but the directing assignment is the next one. Um, I believe it's due sometime next week. Um, but your instructions are on canvas. It's pretty simple. I just want you to watch the scene from the empire strikes back. I know it's, it's another star Wars reference, but, uh, deal with it. This is my class. When you guys direct your own class, you can do whatever you want. Um, I want you to watch this scene between Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker. This was directed by Irving Kirshner. I want you to analyze that scene and focus on the detail of directing. Okay. Uh, once again, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. And I will see you guys in the next one. Okay, bye-bye.